amount of marginal internal cost exactly corrects the decision rule in the market. Okay, so that's the rational rule. So we could say this tax fixes the internality. And now we can just let the market go. We fix the market, and it'll be socially optimal, provided that all the other assumptions hold. Yeah? Okay, so that's the kind of approach we might want to take. We now, if we're doing public policy, right, the great advantage of doing economics, so economics started out as a, as a branch of philosophy, and then as economists started to get more serious about themselves, they decided they were their own thing. In some places, the economics department is in the business school, which starts to maybe make the economists feel like, like maybe they have a social responsibility to get the answer right, because people are actually going to take their answers and do something with them, like run a business. Uh, you could also imagine uh, an economics department being part of a public policy school, where there might be a similar kind of sense of social responsibility. We like to keep ourselves over here in the middle campus, near the clock tower, right, as close to the ivory tower as we can, because we don't want our answers to actually bear any weight. <laughs> we want to just be able to think creatively without having to worry about the consequences. But the reality is, if we're going to do public policy, and we're actually going to consider seriously, because I think that people do, imposing a tax like this, then we need to think seriously about whether or not we can actually estimate that number. So here's a stab. Um, this guy, Kip Viscusi, an audacious economist. He, his specialty is cost-benefit analysis. He's been doing it since 1970. If you've heard people talk about the value of a statistical life, they're talking about Kip Viscusi's research. Okay? Uh, fascinating, audacious, uh, really, I mean, uh, under the Bush administration, the most recent Bush administration, the whole slew of environmental and social policy safety regulations that were not implemented because they failed cost-benefit analysis because the main thing that they benefited society by was increasing, reducing the number of deaths and the value of a statistical life had not been updated for some time. Obama came into power and he said, you know what, I don't know who said it, but somebody in the Obama administration said, let's take this guy Viscusi seriously. He's been telling the administration for some years that they need to update the value of statistical life. So they did, and a whole bunch of policies that had failed cost-benefit analysis suddenly passed cost-benefit analysis. Okay? Kip Viscusi is a powerful person. Here's what he did, along with Hershey's first name, I don't know. He figured out the harm caused by a pack of cigarettes. So we're gonna call one, we're gonna do, we're gonna call this the internality cost from one pack. And here's what he did. He said, let me start by measuring the value of a statistical life for people at different ages, okay? So what's the value of a statistical life for someone who dies when they're 30? Uh, probably making that too big. For someone who dies when they're 40, for someone who dies when they're 50, et cetera, okay? Um, so, I mean, this is complicated, and I don't want to go into detail, but on the one hand, you might think, well, if somebody dies when they're 30, they've got a ton of life ahead of them that they should value a lot. On the other hand, uh, you know, maybe people between 30 and 40 are kind of like not really worth much because they're having some kind of midlife crisis. I don't know. What, so these numbers vary for whatever reason, mostly because there's less light ahead of you. And then what he did was, or they, what they did was they said, now let's actually multiply those numbers by the probability that smoking will kill you at any given age. So say P30, P40, P50, okay, where P, oh, PT is the probability of death by smoking at age T. Okay? And then let's multiply that, whoops, then let's multiply that um, sum it over ages, because of course it's got to be weighted sum. We need to multiply by the proportion of people in the population who are that age. Right? So pi t equals the proportion of the population at age t. Right? You wouldn't want to include the value of statistical life for 30 year olds if there aren't any in the population. And then you just add those things together. And divide that by the number of packs smoked per smoker. I think that's right. And you have the cost of smoking. Um, the, the, the delayed long-term health cost as captured by the, the value of increased risk of death. Now, that's an understatement, right? Because there's lots of things that are, there's lots of health consequences from smoking that don't necessarily kill you. Right? You could spend the last 10 years of your life struggling with emphysema or something like that. So this is, this is at best a, well, it's biased downward, it's biased upwards for that reason. There's a lot of reasons to think that Kipis Guzzi's value of statistical life is actually too high, um, particularly because it's mostly measured uh, by people's willingness to pay to save their own life, which is not the same thing as a statistical life. But at any rate, it's an attempt. <coughs> this, is a, this is a valiant attempt, and I think well worth the effort uh, to just begin to see what we can do in terms of actually putting numbers on these things. That's an estimate of C, okay? That gives you C. Gruber and Kasegi, uh, using a much-simpler methodology, uh, come up with $35 a pack. So these guys, Tsukusi and Hershey, Hershey, came up with 20, $222 a pack for men, $95 a pack for women. I, I don't know what, why those numbers are so different, but these are some attempts to get a handle on C, yes. Oh, the 3% discount is because these people are not going to die right now, they're going to die way out in the future, so we just do time discounting. I, I didn't include it in here, sorry. Yeah, um, we have to do some delta to the something or other. So yeah, sorry, thank you for mentioning it. I didn't include it. And by the way, you don't, you, you don't need to remember this. You don't need to, this is, this is not going to be on the test. Okay, so now we have, some, we have some estimates of C, now we need an estimate of beta, there's tons and tons of field, field research, experimental research, field experimental research, and the range of estimates is between 0.6 and 0.8 typically, so let's just take a beta of 0.7, somewhere in the middle of that range, and then the optimal tax is $10.50 per pack using the uh, Gruber and Tasegi uh, uh, estimates, um, or something like $22.30 if we use the Viscusi and Hirsch, and then if we took a much more conservative beta of 0.9, we'd get 3.50 using the conservative Gruber and Tasegi estimates, or $9.40 using the less conservative estimates from uh, Viscusi and Hirsch. Even the smallest of these, which is right, taking, making the most conservative assumptions we can, um, is a big tax on a pack of cigarettes. Uh, I don't know if there are, there's usually if you ask people to raise their hand if they smoke in a Berkeley classroom, nobody does. And I don't think it's because nobody smokes. Um, but uh, smokers could contemplate on whether or not they would pay, uh, continue to smoke if, they were, uh, if an additional $3.50 tax were imposed on them for their own good. Okay, so we've taken a stab at actually quantifying this thing, even though we can't measure willingness to pay, the true willingness to pay for smoking. We can say, well, it's got some external future, not external, it's got some delayed future cost. We can go and try to put willingness to pay on that. That's, we didn't make that number up. That's people's stated willingness to pay for things that reduce the risk of death. That's what Kipiskusi does. So we're, we're falling back on what we think makes sense, which is willingness to pay in a situation where people aren't being irrational. And we're going to import that into the situation where they are being irrational and try to come up with a national number for the optimal tax. Uh, now let's look at, and I apologize, I, I, um, this next part of the lecture would go a lot more smoothly if I'd actually drawn these graphs on your handout, but um, 
hopefully it will not be overwhelming for you to follow along. Okay, on this first slide, I want you to draw half my size because you got to fit two diagrams onto one in one state. Okay, so I'm gonna fill the screen, but but you'd be best off if you didn't. So under what conditions would this tax make the smoker better off? Suppose, okay, here's quantity, here's price. Suppose this is the observed demand curve. So I'm gonna call that D behavioral, B E H. That's the observed. That's like D proj in the shiny object model, right? That's the observed demand curve, which we're saying is biased upwards because of behavioral irrationality. Okay, and then suppose that the price they're currently paying is here. And I realize that already includes some taxes, but let's not worry about that. That's the price. Now suppose that the rational, uh, those things are supposed to be parallel. They're not. But suppose that the rational demand curve is down here. Now, what do I mean by rational? Two things. Suppose, that would be if the person didn't have hyperbolic discounting, if they didn't have a beta less than one. But another way to put it, um, I think just, just for the sake of clarity, I'm going to redraw that so that they are closer to parallel. The difference between these two lines is what? One minus beta times C. Okay? So D rational is basically what I'm getting at here is that that's, that's the actual benefit to the individual from smoking any given pack of cigarettes or cigarette. Okay? Now, we can crank up the model and say, all right, without the tax, this is sort of Q market or Q behavioral. Okay? If we wanted to get, so what's, where, what's, where would we want to get to? Where's Q opt in this? We would want to get to the place where um, the, we would want to impose a tax equal to the size of the, of the internality, which would mean that we would impose a tax here, and the price that people would actually pay plus the tax would be that, right? And what we would find is that they would all stop smoking. Okay? Because when you force them to pay the internal harm in the immediate moment when they decide to smoke, th it turns out that the, the true long-term harm for them is not worth even the most desirable cigarette. Okay? So this is a situation where the true long-term harm just completely swamps any immediate value from smoking a cigarette. And so this is a situation where the tax would cause smokers to completely stop smoking. So what's the amount of tax revenue that they pay? Zero. Okay? So if you hit someone with a big enough stick, you may actually minimize the harm that you do in your enforcement process. If you enforce something kind of halfway, you may wind up with a bunch of people in solitary confinement all their lives, not really learning the lesson. But the theory behind the death penalty is that if you hit them hard enough, if you give them a big enough threat, they're going to kill you right away if you do this. I'm going to cut off your hand if you steal candy. Okay? That just the threat of it is so big that people don't do it at all, and the real harm that you do to them in the enforcement process is zero. One theory. Um, what's the reduced harm? What's the benefit to society from this thing? Okay? Well, before, let's figure out what the harm was. Before, for all these units that people sort of shouldn't have been smoking, in some sense, the overconsumption due to the internality, the cost that they were paying was this. Sorry, I'm going to switch colors. The cost that they were paying was this, the price. The benefit that they were actually receiving was this, the height of the rat. Okay? So these are units for which the cost to the consumer, and presumably to the producer too, if that price is determined by a horizontal supply curve, that's the harm. So this is the reduction <coughs> in harm from the tax. Okay? Clearly, the smoker's better off. We just forced them to stop doing something really bad. Okay? So we've increased social welfare, right? Because we've taken away a bunch of harm without doing any new harm. But this is, so this is a Hicks Calder improvement in the sense that it increases social welfare. So this is. Sorry, I'll just use the, this, this is an HK improvement. It's also a Pareto improvement, right? Because we've made the smoker better off without harming anybody. I mean, you could say, well, there's a small cost of society from the enforcement mechanism, but we're already taxing cigarettes, so let's just say we're just changing the rate. There's no real cost of society from doing this. Uh, we could talk about that all day. This shouldn't, this, you expect to see smuggling, blah, blah, blah. Let's just ignore that stuff for now. So we can say that this would be both an hex Calder improvement and a Pareto improvement, right? And we would presumably not be accused of paternalism if the smokers are sophisticated because they know that this is harmful to them and they're grateful for the policy. Here's a second example, and I think I'm going to just. Has everybody got this down? Raise your hand if you're still writing. Okay. I think I can. Come on. Let's see, don't erase all of it. Let's, let me just erase the parts I need. OK. So hopefully you've still got enough space for another one of these. So what if instead, great, I apologize for this. What if instead you had a situation where the harm isn't that big relative to the, to the value of, the, of smoking? Okay. So that's 1 minus beta times c, either because beta is bigger or because c is smaller. OK, in this case, we still see the market consumption would be here. But in this case, the place where we should be is no longer zero. I mean, this is where some cigarettes are actually worth the health risk. Um, and so, brr, no, this is not going to work. I need, sorry, I actually need this to be in a very specific place, which is frustrating. I need it to be there. Okay, so Q rat is all, Q opt is all the way over here. So we would get there by imposing a tax equal to 1 minus beta times C. And here's what happens here. This person's still smoking, so they're going to wind up paying some tax uh, cost. But they're going to gain all of this reduction in harm. And you can, I, I think I got it so that, that triangle is bigger than that rectangle. But even if it isn't, you can, you can easily tweak things around so that it is. Right? So you can see that there would be conditions under which, even if the person didn't completely stop smoking, they would nonetheless thank you for the policy. Because the reduced harm that the tax is, is giving them is greater than the tax payment that they make. OK? So um, okay. again, we have this problem between the naive and the sophisticated. Whether the person is naive or sophisticated, if we've got these lines in the right place, we're making them both better off. But the naive might not thank you for this policy and might say you're being paternalistic. And I think we're in a gray area as to whether or not that's a legitimate claim. That might actually be paternalistic if the smoker doesn't realize that they're causing themselves harm. <coughs> Next question. Under what conditions would the tax make society better off? OK. Um, yeah. So what if, what if the harm is actually relatively small compared to the benefit of smoke, the, the, the desirability of smoking? OK, so we have 
Q market there, Q op there. You stick in a tax. That's P, that's P plus T. Now what we're doing is we're reducing harm by that amount, but we're making this person pay that much taxes. Yikes. This person's probably not happy about that, even if they're sophisticated, right? The personal cost of this policy is just too high for the smoker, even if they want a reduction in harm. This is like making a contract with Luigi, but Luigi overcharges. So this is clearly not a Pareto improvement, because the smoker is harmed. But what about society as a whole? The society as a whole made better off by this? Who gets the tax money? Society, right? The government, believe it or not, even in this day and age, is still part of society. Um, there's places in the world where that's not true, where the government is imposed from outside society. Um, but uh, around here, we still like to think the government is part of society, and that money can be spent on society somewhere. So this is just a transfer. It's not really a cost to society. It's just a transfer from one part of society to another, just like with the tax on externality. And so this is just reduced harm for a member of society. And this is very definitely a hit caller improvement. <coughs> but I'm not sure we would want to do it, right? Because the only person that's helping is the same person that's harming. So it's really hard to say that it's really hard to really know what we mean anymore by hit caller improvement. Um, I do want to say, Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of public policy. Is Hicks Calder efficient, but not Pareto efficient? Or rather, is a Hicks Calder improvement, but not a Pareto improvement? If I come during the night and steal your bicycle, right? It is not a Pareto improvement for me to be required to give it back to you. Because that makes me worse off, right? So the law that says it's, that if I steal your bicycle and get caught, I give it back to you is definitely a Hicks Calder improvement. It's not a Pareto improvement. Um, but nonetheless, because of naivete, we still have big questions to ask. Um, the next question we want to ask is, what if not all smokers are irrational? Now, uh, I've got 20 seconds. I'm going to use them, but I'm not going to put any ink on the screen. So far, we're talking about a situation where all smokers are irrational, so putting a tax on them only makes them, only reduces the harm to them, and then we can compare that to the tax. Um, if some smokers are perfectly rational, then putting an additional tax on them, that's just going to be like completely classical model, and we're just going to be creating deadweight loss for those people. So we're going to want to look at under what conditions might we be willing to safely say that the deadweight loss from taxing an irrational smoker is outweighed by the reduction in harm from taxing the irrational smoker. And we'll start off by looking at that on Thursday.